Welcome, and thank you for joining me for this important episode of Society Chat. A major focus of my presidency has been on surgeon wellness. As colorectal surgeons, our jobs take a significant physical and emotional toll on us. The impact of the emotional wear and tear is often subtle and not obvious. We know firsthand that when it comes to adverse events that affect our patients, it's not only the patients who suffer. The psychological and emotional trauma we endure as surgeons in any situation where a patient under our care is adversely affected is called second victim syndrome. Here with us today to discuss second victim syndrome is Dr. Tracy Hull. Dr. Hull is a professor at the Lerner College of Medicine of Case Western University and the holder of the Victor Fazio Chair in Colorectal Surgery at the Cleveland Clinic. And she also is a past president of ASCRS. Dr. Hull, welcome to Society Chat. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm honored to be here. Can you just describe what second victim syndrome is? It's a term that was coined by somebody who was named Dr. Albert Wu in 2000. He was at Johns Hopkins. And it was uh, pretty much in your intro. You described the emotional and physical trauma that uh, caregivers, all caregivers felt after a mistake or uh, adverse patient outcome. There's a lot of people that think we should call it second victim phenomenon because it's a continuum and not an all or nothing syndrome so it means all or nothing. But it's it's exactly what you're describing, this intense reaction that we can get to something that happens adversely for our patients. It feels like we have failed them. And when you said it can be subtle to the person who is internalizing it, it is absolutely a chaotic, you know, over overload of negative emotions. So it can really take a toll. And if it's not addressed, it can lead to PTSD. So that kind of leads to the, the next idea is that sometimes this term of the second victim is not often acknowledged and even somewhat controversial. It's controversial because there's a group of people that feel that it should not be called second victim because the patient and the patient's families are the victim. And victim um, can denote that there must be uh, a perpetrator. And the patient is, is definitely not the perpetrator. We're not saying that at all. And it also uh, means that problems that happen with patients, they feel makes it sound like it's more random. Now, when you really think about people who suffer with second victim, yes, it can be a mistake. And we should be striving very uh, diligently to avoid patient errors and, and have quality care. But you can't tell me that the person that's traumatized taking care of COVID patients uh, who were dying right and left and, and really suffered from the second victim syndrome, you can't tell me that they didn't have a really emotional response. So I don't care what you want to call it. It is, it is real. And I'm not an expert, but I have uh, a lot of interest in it. And I have a lot of interest because especially young people tell me a lot of their issues with this, that uh, how real it is and how it affects them. It affects a lot of people. How prevalent is it? And you know, are there, what are some of the signs or how do we know that this is sort of above and beyond what is just a normal emotional reaction to a, an outcome? It can affect any caregiver. It doesn't have to be a physician. It could be a pharmacist. It could be a nurse. It could be a physical therapist. So it could affect anybody. So number one, it's very uh, wide range when you think of it like that. Um, there have been studies, um, one very um, quoted study said 22% of surgery residents uh, have had symptoms of it, and 86% were almost incapacitated by it, um, meaning that they felt guilty, they had anxiety, they had insomnia. Um, so, so that's not a small number. And when you dig deep into it, why do they feel like that? Well, you know, we have this Halstadian training method in surgery where, you know, we are supposed to be responsible for everything from the that, that happens to our patients, right? And if we, if there's any problem, we have failed them. I don't care if it's a near miss. I don't care by somebody else. I don't care if it's an adverse event. I don't care if it's a mistake. Certainly a death, we have failed them, right? We talk about that in M&M. &M. And 
we have a lot of internalization of that. Uh, and we're supposed to suffer in silence. That's, that's kind of the teaching. And we need to kind of get away from that. It's estimated that 15% of practicing surgeons, and there's one study that said over 80% of anesthesiologists, which really surprised me, um, have had um, second victim uh, or you know symptoms that have given them a lot of um, a lot of issues. So, how can we help our fellow caregivers who suffer from these symptoms, and what can we do to acknowledge that you know that they are truly impacting us personally? Just like everything else, it comes in stages. So, the first stage is the chaos after the problem. Um, you have a death, you have a leak, you have um, a patient that had an incorrect medication dose and was adversely affected. You have somebody bleeding on the table. Try to get the person away from that chaotic situation. Many people then will start to have intrusive thoughts about it. Um, I talked to a resident actually this week who told me, it's a new staff member who told me when they were a resident, um, the staff inadvertently uh, injured an iliac vein and the patient ended up bleeding to death on the table. He still, after four years, has nightmares about it. So, you know, those kinds of things we have to, we have to acknowledge and these intrusive thoughts we have to really be um, thinking about. Then we have to, uh, the fear that of uh, the perception of our colleagues is the next thing that we have to address. Um, we, we lose our personal integrity from that. Then the, the inquisition, the, uh, the reporting in our institutions and how it's handled in the internal and external investigations, those, those are the next step. And if you've ever been involved in a lawsuit, I, can, I, I just know that it has to affect you terribly if it's something that really was, was a patient death or something because I just know how it affected me uh, being, you know, questioned in a lawsuit. And then we have to give these people emotional first aid. The, the best first um, step is just your peers. And there's a lot of discussion that you should not say, oh, you did everything right, just listen. And this is a time to shut up and listen because these, these folks really have a lot of burden on their souls and you need to let them just speak about it. Um, programs and institutions that have uh, dedicated uh, dedicated uh, programs for this, they seem to do better and their people seem to do better. They need to have, um, many need to have real psychological help and you can see why. And then the final disposition, you're either going to drop out and some people drop out, some people commit suicide. It's scary, but there are, you know, 300 to 400 suicides a year of physicians, not even just caregivers, physicians. And, you know, this is felt to be a part of it. Some survive, but just persist and some thrive. And the difference felt to be between thriving and surviving is if your institution supports you and how they support you, how they support you. So you can end up trying to look at it more as a learning situation rather than a punitive situation. We have to recognize that it exists. I, I don't care what you call it. I mean, we've all had something happen that we've done our very best for. A patient leak and the patient dies. And you could have done everything right. And it just shakes you to your core. And we can't let people just like this early career person that I talked to this week, you can't just let people just keep suffering. Um, when they bring it up, we have to have at, we have to think of avenues to really try to help them. Um, we need every good physician we can get and a good caregiver we can get. And we, we need to have good supportive um, ways to help these people move on. We tend to um, silo ourselves and we silo our fellow caregivers because we want them to, we, we just want them to be stoic and deal with it. But, but we have to think of this in a different way. We have to think of this as you know, they, they need help. So, Dr. Hull, if, if, a, if a colleague or somebody listening to this episode here realizes that, wow, this is something that I've been suffering and haven't been aware of it, or I've been fighting, looking for ways to deal with it, what advice would you give them? Number one, find an empathetic ear in one of your friends, your significant other, one of your peers. 
Um, somebody that is it you don't feel is going to judge you. So that would be my first thought. My second thought, if your institution doesn't have a formal program, you need to get professional help. This is, there are people whose lives become totally unraveled. They end up in substance abuse. Um, you know, there's so many examples of this and you don't want to go down that road. It is, it is just way too easy if you are severely affected. So get professional help. Dr. Hall, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us because this is an incredibly important and prevalent issue. Uh, and we look forward to the fact that this is going to uh, you know, educate and bring awareness to our members. So thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you for watching. And remember, this is your specialty and ASCRS is your society. You are part of this legacy of surgeons who have made our specialty what it is today. See you next time.